time. So today's speaker, he received his PhD in electronic engineering in 1992 in Italy. And uh, since 1996, he has been a tenured researcher of the Fund of Scientific Research of Belgium's French community and the research director of Liber de Brussels, Belgium, ULB. He's the inventor of the ant colony optimization metaheuristic. His current research interests include swarm intelligence and swarm robotics. He is the editor in chief of Swarm Intelligence. He is an IEEE, AAAI, and AAAI fellow. He was awarded the Italian Prize for Artificial Intelligence in 1993, the EU Marie Curie Excellence Award in 2003, the Belgian Dr. A. De Lu Award in Applied Sciences in 2005, the Spanish International Prize for Soft Computing in 2007, an ERC Advanced Grant in 2010, the IEEE Frank Rosenblatt Award in 2015, and the IEEE Evolutionary Computation Pioneer Award in 2016. So our speaker today, Professor Marco Dorigo. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ann, for the... Yeah, uh, you need to uh, use this or that. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Professor Ann, for the kind of invitation and the introduction. Um, very glad to be here in Peking, Beijing, for the first time, and uh, to find all these new friends. So let me start <coughs> by saying that, okay, um, maybe some of you know me about, because of my work on ant collectivization, I'm not going to talk about that today. So today I just talk about robots, in particular about the swarm bots and swarm annoy. So <clears throat> let me first, short introduction where I'm located. So this is the world, here is China, here is Europe. Within Europe, this is Belgium. Brussels is the capital of the European Union. And this is the building where my lab occupies the last floor. And um, we are, depending on the funding, we are between 20 and 40 researchers. Okay? So at this point in time, we are approximately 30. And uh, it's a very international uh, research lab because uh, I would say that over 30 researchers, there might be one from Belgium. All the others are from different countries, uh, among which also some Chinese. And um, we are specializing in swarm intelligence, swarm robotics, in stochastic optimization, and in business intelligence. So in particular, I direct these two groups, of swarm intelligence, stochastic optimization. And um, as I said today, I talk only about this part, in particular, swarm robotics. So, <coughs> sorry. So let me start, since I say that I, I work on swarm intelligence to try a definition. So we can see swarm intelligence as a system property. Okay. So in this, if you see swarm intelligence as system properties, we can define it as a complex global behavior, which is shown by the distributed system, and that is the result of self-organized interactions between the agents. And these interactions are local interactions. So this means that there is nobody in charge and only nearby closely related individuals interact with each other. But the swarm intelligence is also a research discipline which studies the collective behavior of decentralized self-organized systems that are made up of a population of agents which interact locally with each other and with their environment. And it is through this local interaction that we have some emergent or resulting behavior. So the, in, the, in a swarm intelligence system, the individual do not have global knowledge of the environment. 
So they cannot localize themselves in terms of absolute or shared coordinates. This is important because there are around many papers where you find the word swarm intelligence and then there is some external infrastructure that gives this uh, global information. So, which means that uh, they are not really swarm intelligence systems. So this, in this uh, swarm intelligence system, the individuals have direct interaction only with their neighbors or with the local environment. And in general, do not exploit the hierarchical or centralized form of control. So they are all the same. <coughs> so why am I or we, are we interested in swarm robotics? Um, well, first of all, swarm robotics is embodied swarm intelligence. Okay? So this means that it's a form of swarm intelligence where the agents are robots. And swarm robotics studies how to design, build, and control swarm or robots that cooperate with each other. And it does so by using swarm intelligence principle. So what I said before, decentralized control, local sense of communication, self-organization. So I was saying, why are we interested in swarm robotics? Because we believe that uh, it can have some, swarm robots can have some nice properties. So they, if you have a swarm of many simple robots that self-organize, they could do what the more complex robot does, but with some additional properties like fault tolerance, scalability, parallelism. So fault tolerance is uh, quite easy to understand. If you have many robots that perform a task, if, uh, but they perform in a cooperative way and they are all the same, when all, one of these robots breaks down, another one can take over. Um, there is not one robot that is a point of failure. Okay, so since there is no chief, there is nobody, no robot that is more important than the others, so there is no single point of failure. And additionally, since uh, the system is made of many simple robots, they are less prone to failure than a more complex robot that performs the whole task. Also, scalability, since the robots self-organize, if you want to perform more work, you just add the new robots. You don't have to reprogram the system. And parallelism, obviously, if you have many robots, you could decide at some point, or they could decide at some point, some of the robots do something, some other robots do something else, and this is not possible if you have a single powerful robot. So, these are the why, which means that we do not have systems that have all these properties for the moment. Okay? So these are the goals of the research. So we are trying to <coughs> build swarm more robots that self-organize so that they have these properties. So we have reached some results, but there is still a lot of research to be done. So the long-term goal of the research in my lab is to show that it is possible to control such as swarm of robots in a way that they cooperate to solve problems that they could not solve alone. And uh, to show that this can be done using the swarm intelligence principle that I just mentioned. Okay. So <coughs> As you probably know, to do research in robotics, you need quite a lot of money because you, have, you need to buy robots, you need many students uh, to do the experiments and so on. So uh, fortunately, over the years, I was able to secure a fair amount of money through a number of European projects. So maybe you don't know about FET. FET is the Future and Emerging Technologies um, program of the European Union. They are very competitive projects that fund um, blue sky research. So absolutely not application oriented, it's basic research. And uh, so I was uh, the coordinator of Swarmbots. It was the first project in Europe on swarms of self-assembling robots, then of Swarmanoid, 
And then more recently, my lab had two European Research Council grants. These are new form of funding in Europe that is open also to people from outside that want to come to work to Europe. And these differently from these projects that are cooperative, so many different countries, groups from different countries can participate. These ones are um, big grants that are given to single um, researchers. Okay, so these are all, all projects that funded the, the research that I will present today. So we, I will start with Swarmbots. So what is a Swarmbot? It's a, an artifact, so something that was built by us, that is composed of a number of simpler robots that we call S-Bots. And these S-Bots are capable of self-assembling, so attached to each other, and to self-organize to adapt to their environment. So the S-Bot can connect and disconnect from each other to form structures that are bigger. So you see here one of these robots. So this uh, is an S-Bot. Um, the most characterizing aspect is this gripper that allows the robot to attach to each other. So the robots are seven, uh, so big. 17 centimeters of diameter. And um, they have a number of sensors, actuators, they have a vision, they can switch on lights so that they communicate using lights, they have infrared and so on. And they can grasp another robot and attach physically to another robot. And um, one of these gripper is strong enough to lift Robot. Also, they have a tracks and wheels, so they can move on flat terrain like here, or on moderate, moderately rough terrain like what you see here. Okay, so what we studied in this project is <coughs> uh, physical cooperation between the robots. So. One of these swarmbots, the swarmbot is when they are attached to each other, okay? um, could, for example, be able to move or wrap the rain where a single robot would get stuck. Or they could overcome an obstacle that a single spot could not be able to overcome. Or transport an item too heavy. Or transport a broken robot to a repair center. So, for example, here you see three s bot attached to each other to form a swarm bot. And by being attached to each other, they can help each other and they manage to pass over a rock. Or in this example, you can see a swarm bot done of five s bot that manages to pass over a step. <laughs> okay, so and this one was abandoned because there, is, there was a, a safety mechanism here. So basically the, the connection was going to break down and so the, the, rather than breaking the connection and repairing it later, um, this was a better option. Um, so I was saying another thing they could do, they could transport an heavy object. And in this case, uh, it's not an object, it's a child. We put some uh, red bars in the, uh, attached to the child so that the robots could find the red bars. And then four swarm bots, each of um, four or five, s bots are formed, and then they start to pull. <laughs> okay, so these are just some examples of what these robots could be uh, used to do or what they could do. Um, what you see here is an experimental environment that we've been using to run experiments. 
to study how to coordinate the behavior of these robots. And um, so in the environment, there is an object here. It's a heavy object, so it cannot be moved around by a robot. They need to cooperate. And then there are, these are the robots, these are smaller circles. Um, each of these robots has a has vision uh, range that is quite limited. <laughs> and here there is a goal location, which in the environment is represented by a light. And what the robots should do is to transport the object from the, its local, uh, initial location to the goal location. And since they have a limited vision range, they need to cooperate to find a path, and they also need to cooperate to transport because the object is too heavy. So what, um, in some experiments, there are also obstacles that can be holes or walls, but in the experiments I show now, there are, there are no obstacles. Um, so we took, to program the robots, so to write the controllers for the robot, we took a behavior-based approach. Basically, behavior-based approach, which was proposed in, in the 90s by Rodney Brooks, uh, says that you identify a number of behaviors that you want the robots to have. Then, once you have identified this behavior, you write the controllers for each behavior, and then you find a way to put them together. And so the behavior we, are, we identified are coordination. So the robots, when they are attached to each other, they must be able to move around. Since they have track, they must be able to align their tracks while they're moving around. They must be able to self-assemble, so to attach to each other and uh, disassemble. They must be able to transport uh, something heavy in a cooperative way. And they must be able to find the goal and uh, construct a path from the object to the goal. So to <coughs> develop these behaviors, we took two approaches. One is based on one particular type of machine learning that is evolutionary robotics. In particular, we evolve neural networks that control the robots. And in some other case, we use by inspired design. That is, we take inspiration from biological, but some biological behavior that is similar to what we want to obtain. So in the first, in the first case, evolution robotics was used to develop coordinated motion self assembly cooperative transport. So just to briefly show you um, how we did it, let's consider the coordinated motion behavior. Okay. So <coughs> basically we design a perceptron that is a very simple neural network that connects input to output directly. And uh, we use evolutionary algorithm like genetic algorithm to evolve the weights of the network. And um, we test the controls that we develop in simulation until we get some good results. And then these good results, so these good controllers are testing the real robots. And if we are, we are happy, fine. Otherwise, we recycle. Because you know that the, one of the problems of evolutionary robotics is that it, um, it tends to exploit um, particularities of the environment. So if your simulation is not good enough, or if it is in some, sense, in some way different from the real world, what you, when you obtain a very good behavior for your simulated robots, maybe it does not work at all on the real one. So you have always to do this cycling. So the, the type of behavior that we want to obtain is one where robots that are attached to each other start with any direction of the tracks, and after some negotiation, they manage to move together. So the way we did is next slide. Sorry. So we take four robots that are already 
attached to each other. As I say, that their chassis, so their tracks are randomly oriented. And we have evolved this uh, perceptron, particularly the weights. So what we do is, uh, um, so I guess the next slide, we encode in a genotype, so in a string of bits, um, the value of the parameters of the neural network, and then we apply generational evolution algorithms. Basically, we have uh, 100 individuals that are evolved for 100 generations. I teach a generation that 20 best individuals are allowed to reproduce, and uh, then some mutation is applied, and uh, we test each of these individuals, which represent the weight of a network, on one spot. We run a test, and we measure. Um, sorry, it's not teach one test. We measure the fitness, that is the quality of uh, the neural network, by looking at the uh, performance of the swarm bot. Okay. And this performance is measured by how far the swarm bot was able to move. So at the, very, at the beginning, the swarm bot uh, just move a little bit, and then as soon as the network gets better, they move farther and farther. So this is typical graph of the results that we get. Here is the generation number. This is the average fitness, and this is the fit or the average quality, and this is the quality of the best individual. So once we have done things in simulation, we test them, and we test them on a number of different configurations because we don't want our results to be very good for this configuration, for example, but to not work at all for the others. And we recycle until we get something that is satisfying. Okay, so you see in this case, uh, the controller is able to control all the different configurations of robots. <coughs> okay, in a similar way, we develop the behavior for the self-assembly. Okay, so what in this case, what the robots have developed is uh, the, a program, so a, a neural network, that exploits two colors, blue and red. And the meaning that we could give to these colors is like red means attach to me, grasp me, and blue is stay away from me. So when a, a robot becomes red, it starts the self-assembly process. And then the other robots that you see, they turn around on themselves. So they look, and when they see something red, they move towards the red and try to grasp it. And once everybody is red, the self-assembling is completed. And also, <coughs> in a similar way, the cooperative transport here, just a movie to show that the robots are attached to the object to be transported and they cooperate. Okay. <coughs> now, the, the fourth behavior was the goal search and path formation. For this one, we took a bio-inspired approach. And in particular, we tried to mimic the Hans trail formation. Um, but Unfortunately, our robots cannot lay pheromones on the ground, so we took a different uh, analogy, yeah? a different approach. Instead of using the pheromones, we use the spots themselves. So I will explain in a moment. The robots that we use, though, that are the spots, have limited sensing capabilities. They can distinguish three colors or four colors maximum, up to 30 centimeters away. And they can say which color is closer because they have, a, um, they have a vision that works this way. They have a camera that points to the ceiling. And they have these, uh, um, if you just look at the image, they have these uh, uh, cylindric plastic. And here there is a spheric mirror. Okay? So the camera looks up, and there is a spheric mirror that gives 
360 degree vision around. But this vision is very noisy, so it's uh, not very precise. Okay, so <coughs> the way the algorithm works is uh, the, the very basic, simple version of the algorithm is the following. Um, so this is gray circle is the robot. This is the robot sensing distance. So that means that a robot can see up to this distance. This is the goal location, and this is the object to be retrieved. So at the beginning, the robot move around in the environment randomly. So they, <coughs> uh, yeah, they just move around randomly, and they look around. And as soon they, they have some simple rules. These simple rules say, for example, that when they see uh, a color and uh, they are at a given distance from this color, which is uh, the distance given by their sensing distance, okay, they can stop and assume a new color. So, for example, this robot here is uh, at its distance, sensing distance from the blue, which is the goal. And so it can stop and become green. I say I can because everything is probabilistic. Okay? So it's a certain probability to become green. Similarly, if uh, I see green, I have a certain probability to become, I think, if I remember, yellow. And if I see yellow, I have a certain probability to become blue. So by this uh, simple mechanism, you can build virtual chains. So in this case, the robots are not physically attached to each other. Right? So the chain is virtual. And this chain can grow in any direction. So in this case, here, to make the example simple and fast, I'm growing the chain in the direction of the object. But this will not happen all the time. Also, if a robot is at the end of the chain, like this one, and it does not see any other free robot. So uh, this is a free robot. And does not see any other free robot. It has a certain probability to say, I give up and I break the chain. So that uh, all the robots in the chain becomes free again. So the, the process is kind of uh, a random search in the environment, starting from the goal and building chain in all directions until one of the chains reaches the object. <coughs> like what you see here. Um, once one of the chains reaches the object, then the chain is frozen, which means that the, the, the robots cannot leave the chain anymore. But the other robots, the, free, the remaining three robots, can follow the chain, which has a directionality because of the three colors. They can follow the chain and go and grasp the op find and grasp the red object. At that point, when they grasp the red object, their behavior becomes try to pull the object towards the closest element of the virtual chain. And they pull, but if the object is very heavy, they do not manage to move it. So they have they wait that another one arrives, and at some point they are enough and the objects start to move, and they can retrieve it to the goal. Okay, as I said, this is a very simple implementation of the algorithm. Um, we have studied, and you can easily imagine improvements. So for example, instead of starting only from the goal, you can start from the object and from the goal. Or you can have the chain sweep the environment turning around. You can have mechanisms to make the chain straight, so that you use less robots, and so on. But these are small technical improvements that are not so important um, from the logical point of view. OK, so now <coughs> what you see here is a simulation. So we have built a 3D physics uh, simulation environment so that we can run uh, experiments that are, whose results are very close to the real world uh, in simulation. And uh, you see here, this is the goal, and these are the objects to be retrieved. And uh, the robots start to build chains that you will see appear and disappear. 
And so at some point, this chain grows until the object there is reached, and then the robots find the object by following the chain. So it is important to understand that these robots in the chain, or any of the robots in this system, does not know anything about what he's doing. It's just applying rules, it's very simple rules. So any of these robots is there and stays in the chain because the rules say that I see a yellow, I see a blue, so I stay there. Okay? But if at some point one sees only one, then, so for example, this yellow see only a blue robot, then it has some probability to give it up and destroy the chain. So the robots here, they change their role dynamically while the experiment happens. And uh, um, what you can observe, that I will explain now again with the experiment with the real robot, is that robots dynamically take up different roles, forming different teams. So we will have exploring robots that are those that, uh, in my drawing before, were the gray robots. So they, they're just exploring the environment. You will have robots that join the chains, and you have robots that retrieve the object. And uh, these robots can move from one to the other all the time. <coughs> and so this experiment, when we did it, was the first example of a self-organized swarm where there was the emergence of these different roles in the swarm without anybody having programmed them. So here is the experiment, one of the experiments with the real robot. So this is the goal. This is the object to be retrieved. And these are the randomly placed robots. So the experiment starts. <coughs> and the robots will start to be chains here. Okay? So you see, uh, for example, this chain is being built and then it is destroyed. This chain was built, but then it's destroyed. This goes on all the time. <coughs> this is sped up five times. And uh, so now you see for a while it was there, and then the robots are again free. And now the chain that connects to the object has been built. And this robot, you see that is still trying to build the chain in the other direction because they don't know. And basically when they happen to follow this chain, they find the red, they grasp it and start to pull. And um, you will see in a moment that these robots, they make something stupid because they, because of their poor vision, they move away from the chain. Okay, just the moment here, I think, if I remember well, they, okay, they move away. And the other robots basically repair automatically the chain by filling in the gap. And that the system starts again to, uh, so the robot, the red robot starts again to retrieve the object. Okay, so, <coughs> um, so as I say, this was, This was uh, the, one of the main results of that project and was the first example of self-organized creation of teams in a school. Now, one thing that we studied after this uh, first uh, result was how to uh, let the robot self-assemble when it was necessary to do something. Okay? So this is what we called functional self-assembly, and uh, which then prompted us to study morphology control. So how the robots attach to each other, well, how, to, how can they form different shapes. So the goal was to let the S-bot self-assemble when needed, and to give them the capability of choosing the shape of their connection. So to, to, to better explain, 
This is an example of what I mean by function self-assembly. This robot here has to go here. It arrives where there is a gap. So it cannot go alone. It stops. It switches on its red light. That is something like asking for help. And other nearby, nearby robots see the red light, self-assemble. And then once they are attached all together, they can pass over the gap. Okay, so we started this, we started studying this by studying, by considering an environment where the robots had to go, let's say, from there to here, and in between there was a hill. And <coughs> in this, this hill could be very steep or not. So when the robot is, uh, when the hill is not steep, like here, the robot managed to pass. Okay, so, however, when the yield is steep, they don't. So the idea was to use uh, this functional self-assembly to let the robot, using the sensors, understand whether the hill is too steep or not, and if it is too steep, to start the self-assembly procedure. So for example, this one arrives there, so it switches on this blue light to say, oh, guys, too, it is too steep. Then randomly, one of the robots becomes red and starts the self-assembly procedure. So the other two robots attach or grasp. <coughs> and once they have grasped, they manage to pass over the hill. Okay, so this was nice, but we run the experiment many times. So what what you can see here is that we are not always lucky. So here the robots attached each other, and then unfortunately <laughs> it does not work. The first, the first thing we thought was, okay, let's give more intelligence to the robots. So they, they attach to each other, when they approach, they know their relative position, so <laughs> they understand that they are going to fall, so they turn 90 degrees, and then they can pass. <coughs> but then we decided that it was more interesting to, stand, to study a more general solution, so to let the robot self-assemble, for example, here, a blob is better than a line. Okay? So how can they control the way they self-assemble? So now, oh, this is electricity. So I have here a short movie that explains what we have been doing. Basically, we are using the colors to um, let the robot tell the other robots where they should uh, grasp. Self-assembling robots can form different connected morphologies. Some morphologies are particularly well suited to solving specific tasks. In this video, we use the Swarmbot robotic platform to show how robots can autonomously form into specific morphologies. Each so-called S-Bot is completely autonomous. The pattern formation mechanism that we designed is completely distributed. That means that none of the S-Bots have any global idea of the pattern that is being formed. The S-Bot LED ring and camera allow S-Bots to locate each other and provide a simple form of communication. As the S-Bots connect to each other, they use simple rules based on what they can see around them to decide how to extend the pattern. This type of visual communication and navigation is, however, extremely limited because of the range of the camera and the limited processing power of the S-Bot, which only allows for crude three-color segmentation. An S-Bot can open what we call a connection slot by lighting up its blue and green LEDs. A connection slot indicates both the desired angle and the specific place in which a connecting S-Bot should grasp. 
After each connection, both the gripped and gripping S-bots change their configurations. These configuration changes follow simple rules based on what the S-bot can see in his immediate surroundings. By manipulating these simple rules, different morphologies can be formed. Each robot only acts on the basis of local information. None of the robots have any concept of a global morphology. Nonetheless, when many robots all follow the same specific set of rules, a distinct global morphology emerges. The morphology generation mechanism is generic and allows for an arbitrary number of different morphologies to be formed. To demonstrate the mechanism, we formed four different morphologies. The star morphology, the line morphology, the arrow morphology, and the dense morphology. We generated morphologies using up to nine real autonomous robots. The morphology generation mechanism proved robust and reliable, with a connection success rate of over 90%. Because the morphology construction mechanism is distributed, it scales well. We have conducted scalability tests with larger numbers of robots in simulation. In ongoing research, we are currently extending this system so that the robots can adapt to different situations by autonomously choosing and constructing an appropriate morphology. Okay, so now that we had this mechanism to control the morphology, we started to uh, study how to use it. And uh, to do so, <coughs> we imagined an experimental environment where the robots need to take different morphologies to perform their task. And in this case, the, the environment is what you see here. The robots start here, and then there is a gap here, which is large. So a single robot, not even two robots, can pass over it. They have to make a, uh, create a long line. Here there is a bridge, but the bridge is narrow, and the robots um, must take a particular configuration to be able to pass over it. And then and finally there is an inclined plane where the robots should push a ball up to the final location. So what we did was to study different types. Yeah, here, <coughs> sorry, you see, you see the final result. Uh, the robots here take the shape of a line and they manage to pass over. So basically what they could do is um, one robot arrives here, if he realizes with his uh, infrared sensors that the gap is too big, then he asks for another one to attach, and then the robots can feel whether it's far, uh, is close enough to be able to pass or not, and so the structure can grow until they can pass over the gap. Then we have these other experiments. What you see here is the failure when the shape is not good, and this is what happens when the shape is correct. So here the robots arrive, and then and then the robots basically go hand by hand. Oh, sorry. So the robots go hand by hand, and you see here the very nervous student that ready to save the robot yeah very nervous because the robots costed the 10,000 euros the, yeah quite expensive um, so you see uh, even when they are in a line they do not manage to pass because obviously they is not stable <coughs> and finally here you see the robots pushing the ball here they must create a shower shape for example, a line does not work. So then the idea was to create an environment, <coughs> but this is something we have not done yet, we just did it in simulation, an environment where the robots are given these three tasks in a random order, and then they should be able to perform them 
in parallel, like what you see here. But this is, as I said, this done only in simulation, and not yet with the real robots. Okay, so <coughs> let me now go to the last part of my presentation. I will now talk about the swarmanoid. Um, okay, first swarmanoid, the name is uh, uh, a word that did not exist in English. Well, probably does not exist in English even now, but you can find it if you search on the internet. Um, it's a contraption of swarm and the humanoid. And the, we called it our robots in this way because we wanted to show that the swarm of robots could, do, could perform a task that you would think immediately, oh, this is for a humanoid robot. And the task we wanted to consider is there is a book somewhere on a shelf and you want to go pick it up and bring it back. <coughs> so we created to do this as womanoid a swarm, an heterogeneous swarm. That means a swarm composed of different types of robots. Three types of robots that we call N-bot, Footbot, and the iBot. These names are reminiscent of their function. So the N-bot is a robot that manipulates objects. So basically, it has two arms with grippers. The, there are cameras here in the grippers. And so it can manipulate objects, but it cannot move around. So it needs to be transported. It can also use its uh, arms to climb structures. <coughs> it, it, has, it has a ceiling attachment system that helps in climbing. So this is uh, the oops, this is the robot, the the, the handbot. Then <coughs> we have the footbot. The footbot is a better engineered version of the S-bot that we have seen before. Basically, are robots that can attach to each other. The attaching mechanism is a simpler, more better performing. And they can be used to transport around the footbot, the, the handbot, sorry. So the two or three footbots can grasp an handbot and transport it around. And then we had a, a, a high bot, which is quad rotor, that can help with vision capabilities because it's flying, it sees better the environment. <laughs> so the idea was to. Um, deploy this swarm in an in office environment, like here, and then the iBot, which are fast and have good vision, they start exploring the environment until they find the object. So they use an algorithm that is similar to the one that I was explaining before for the iBot. Okay? So they build chains, and then at some point they find the object. But then instead of retrieving the object, they use the colors of the light, because they have uh, lights all uh, around, to help the robots on the ground to find their way. And the footbot here transport the endbot to the final location. <coughs> okay, so I show you the movie with the experiment. So here you see the, uh, for example, uh, here. Oh, sorry. Here, this ro this uh, flying robot sees that there is nothing inside, so it stays there to avoid that other robots go inside the, to search the room because it's uh, useless. And. Uh, now the chain is completed, so the robot, the iBot signal, here I put arrows, but in the real robots are lights, to help the robots on the ground to find their way. And when the robots on the ground find their way, they arrive there, they place the endbot near the structure, and they climb the structure to go retrieve the book. <coughs> but I think this is nicer to be seen with the real movie. Swarmanoid is a heterogeneous robotic swarm made up of three types of robot. 
The handbot is designed to manipulate objects. The handbot down. The footbot is a wheeled robot with a gripper. Using its gripper, a footbot can form physical connections with other footbots or with the handbot. The iBot can fly and rapidly explore large areas. It can attach to the ceiling and provide environmental information to the other robots. In this film, the swarmanoid is deployed to find and then retrieve a book. Here, the swarmanoid has already partially explored its environment. As the iBots search, successive iBots attach to the ceiling, forming a connected network. Once an iBot has found the book, the knowledge propagates back to the deployment area. The handbot then requests transport assistance from the footbots. Using the iBot network, the footbots form a ground-based chain linking the deployment area to the book. The composite footbot handbot entity then follows this ground-based chain. A second handbot prepares for transport. The first footbot handbot entity has rotated and aligns with the bookshelf. While climbing, the handbot supports its weight with a cord attached to the ceiling. Actuated fans give the handbot control over its angle of rotation around the vertical axis. Swarmanoid is a parallel distributive system. Parallel activity and redundancy increase its robustness and flexibility. The second footbot handbot could retrieve another book that will act as a backup should the first footbot handbot fail. In this film, the swarmanoid retrieves a single book. However, the true value of the swarmanoid concept would manifest itself in parallel task execution scenarios and in unstructured environments. Future incarnations of the swarmanoid might be able to replace human workers in hazardous environments, perform search and rescue missions, or even conduct exoplanetary exploration. Okay, so I wish to conclude by thanking all the different people. You see there is a, quite a high number of people that have been helping me with this project, um, many PhD students. And um, I just wanted to remind 
you that we have a swarm intelligence conference every other year. This year is uh, in a few weeks in Rome, in Italy. And there is a journal, as Professor Han mentioned before, that is covers the field. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. This uh, wonderful talk. And, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Oh, shocked by your talk. <laughs> Please don't don't be shy. You can ask in Chinese, <laughs> and uh, someone will translate. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your share. Uh, I, I have a question at the first part, the videos in the first part. Can you give me the video in your PPT PowerPoint? Uh, uh, and I see there have a um, black, uh, uh, black block in the video. Uh, I want to know the black block in the video is to use to tell the robots where is it? Is it? Is it used to tell the robots the location of it? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understood. The, uh, can I go to the video that you mentioned? Can you send, tell me which one? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, everyone is okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, next one. This one? Next one. Okay, the, uh, the black block in the video. Uh, there are so many black blocks uh, between the robots. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. no. I want to know the black block is using to tell the uh, ah. robot uh, no, no, the no. location, no. is it? No, it's just the way the, the, way the, the drawing that you see here, something, no, it's nothing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, the robot, they do not know where they are. They don't have no localization. They can only see each other. Uh, pardon? They can only see each other. So these things here are drawings on the ground, but they have no role in the experiment. Uh, so the every one of the robots don't know the location of it is? Its own location with respect to the environment? No. But they can see the other robots. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> so, I can ask a question in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, answer in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ciao. Okay. So, uh, very, very wonderful work, first. And I, I see many uh, morphologies can be shaped yeah. by, by your intelligence. So, I'm wondering uh, what is the most frequent morphology that you ever saw? Yeah, uh, yes. yeah we, ne we did not study um, autonomous formation of morphology. So I can tell you that all with this algorithm, all the morphologies will be um, tree-like. So this so is always -like. a root yes. and then they grow. This, and is they more, do not... this is a more frequent shape, you mean? No, no, there is, uh, we did not study the frequency of the form. We've just what what we did was to create a library of programs so that the robots can say, okay, I want to form a star or I want to form a harrow, I want to form a blob, and they can choose. But they, we did not study how frequent is the formation of different. Yeah, I'm just just wondering when <laughs> performing different tasks. Yeah. There should be maybe one or some of the better morphologies yeah. to perform this task. So how is this uh, specific so specific shape is self-organized during the during the interactions? Okay, so the these uh, <coughs> in the experiments that I've shown, this is the choice of the best shape is not self-organized. 
Okay, so this is a, a further step. So we, and when you do this uh, type of uh, research, you have to build many steps, many components to arrive. Uh, and uh, now we have the mechanism to say, I want the blob or I want the line and so on. Then the next step is how the robot decide whether it's better one or the other. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. I, I'm wondering uh, how the iBots know where is the book and send the information on location of book to a uh, boot, uh, boot bot, food, food bot. Okay. And so are there some map uh, build in the iBot? Uh, are there some maps of the, uh, no, no, the no, situation? No, 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 no. Yeah. The, the, you remember this? This experiment here, this, this algorithm, right? The path formation that I've shown for the, for the robots on the ground. Uh, okay, so the, the iBot. The, yeah, yeah, iBot. Yeah, the iBot uses a similar algorithm. It's similar algorithm. So yeah, it's so randomly they, flying in a... They so start flying and they search the environment and they build the chain. And when one robot sees the book, mm -hmm. the chain is uh, formed, is completed. And then at this point, they... So you see that they are attached to the city. Uh -huh. And they switch on their lights so that the robots on the ground can see the lights. And so the, when they switch on the lights, for example, they switch red on one side and green on the other side. So the robot on the ground can see and understand which direction. Yeah, so there are many eyeballs to parallel working. Yeah. With this. Thank you. Uh, OK, you go free. <laughs> Could you explain the, the input and the output of the perception again, and how are they related to the swarm noise? The input and output of what? Of the perception you show. Yeah, yeah. Time. Okay. So, but this this was not in the swarm noise, but it was rather in the swarm bot. This particular, right? the the one of uh, where you had the connected spots that have to move in a coordinated way. Okay, so each robot, each spot, has a sensor that is called traction sensor. Basically, when they attach to another, they can feel the force. Okay, and uh, this force is given as input here, and the output is the how the upper part of the robots where the gripper is uh, attached should rotate with respect to the base. Okay, so basically here you get the force and here the output is should I rotate in this way or in this way or should not rotate at all. Okay, okay so Professor. <coughs> so very interesting that for me. Okay, so I wonder when I look at the patterns that robots has made, it's just like uh, some ants. If you're from, from far away to see that, you know, yeah. some ants to do something, to do something like uh, transport, transport the food or just uh, find uh, some goals. Yeah. So, uh, have you already make a comparison between the real ants? and uh, your as robots to get, get some conclusions about uh, your no, the, the So my work is, is not about uh, um, trying to build models, but rather to take what well, I'm uh, in a group of, in engineering. So we build robots and we want to control them. And uh, in principle, if the model that I use control robots is a similar or not to the real ones, I don't care. Okay. So the, as far as it works with the robot. So on the other side, is, so I did not do any study to try to match my models to the real ants or other insects. But it's true 
that when you look at this, it reminds a lot of the way ants do things, right? because it's quite chaos, uh, it's a lot of movement that is apparently not useful, but then they manage to do what they should do. And uh, what we did uh, was, for example, uh, remove some robots or add the new robots and the system continues to work like what happens with ants because it has some properties that are similar but the the model and the algorithm are completely different okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> maybe we can pass this uh, microphone <laughs> <laughs> This is behavior. Yes. Self-organized. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, thanks. Uh, it is a very interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, especially the last video, yeah, I like it a lot. And uh, because I'm a totally learner, so I will just ask one question. And just pardon me if it is stupid. <laughs> so uh, because for the last uh, in the last video, so there's uh, different kinds of uh, robots. So uh, because you already said there will be uh, there will be the past information using the I robots, right? Yeah. So is that possible to just uh, like uh, combine the uh, you know, uh, the hand robots with the uh, eye robots, so... You mean combine uh, physically? Uh, yeah, so so uh, so then is that possible to just use the eye robots, you know, combine them together and just uh, uh, like transport them in the sky, not, not on the ground? <laughs> uh, okay, so in principle, yes, but in practice, the weight that this uh, quad rotor can lift is limited, and the uh, hand water are very heavy. So you, oh, yeah. you can. <coughs> I'm sure that one can redesign and rebuild different robots where the hand bots are much lighter okay. and the uh, eye bots are much bigger, and then you can do what you propose. But it cannot be done with these robots. Okay. Because the 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 the, the high bot are not powerful enough to lift the end bot. Okay, but if uh, like for some some light objects, it is possible. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, but have you have you tried to do some experiments like that or? No, no, because it was not the goal here. What the goal of these experiments was to study cooperation okay. among among different ro type of robots. So what you propose would be a completely different experiment. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so we can pass the microphone to next uh, Thank you for your wonderful report and I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, I don't know uh, uh, if one uh, exports are hacked and uh, they were, uh, and they may send false uh, signal to others, uh, maybe uh, it will roll the, uh, roll the whole group task. How do you solve this problem? If, if one robot does what? Hacked and send, send false uh, signal to others. Send like false, false, wrong signal, right? I'm wrong. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you, you mean, <coughs> no, the robots cannot, uh, for what concern of force, I cannot make uh, anything false because it's just, I mean, if I'm going against him, I'm pushing, I cannot. If I'm pushing, I'm pushing. I, can, I cannot. There is something false. But in, in general, there is. Um, so in, in, in all my experiments, I'm making the hypothesis that the robots do what they are supposed to do. So there might be more complicated situations where. Some of the robots are malicious, so they are bad robots. So they want to disrupt. And that is another research question. And then I'm, I'm studying that issue, but I've not been discussing this here. 
So we are studying now to identify robots that pretend to do something, but they really are doing something different. For example, it is not possible with the force, but you could uh, give a wronger light signal. So you switch on uh, red and instead of blue. Okay, this is something that the robots could do. And we are studying this, but in a separate research. Okay. Um, the third one, maybe, um, I just want to know if this this kind of chain uh, has some has some connections with uh, blockchain. Yeah, yeah. The, no, wait. This chain has no connection with blockchain, but the 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 research direction where I study how to identify malicious robots that research direction has to do with blockchain, but it's completely unrelated to, to this chain. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next question goes to this girl, and uh, maybe you can pass the microphone backwards. Uh, hi, Professor. I think it's a very, very interesting job, and I want to ask a question about this radio. Uh, in the very beginning, and the, in, in the process of the, those robots, uh, uh, Find I uh, want to find their track, and uh, some some maybe some several robots will change their colors, such as oh at the beginning it is green, but then there's no no color and uh, turn to black and then to um, purple, something like this. I think I wonder is some process in this why they change the color. So the the robots have simple rules. And the rules are like, I see blue, I become yellow. I see yellow, I become green. I see green, I become blue. Okay. So they can apply any of these. So, so is there some rule in it, or just uh, change it randomly? No, these are, each robot has the same set of rules. But if I am a robot and I see blue, I become yellow. If, I'm, I, if uh, 10 seconds later, I don't. I become free. I become black, and then instead of seeing blue, I see green. Then I become purple. So I can take many different colors at different times, because depending on what I see, I react in a different way. Kind of situation. Yeah. Okay, the gentleman. <coughs> okay, thank you. So. Uh... I'm quite uh, interested in the part of uh, morphology. So I can see from your video that you can, uh, your uh, S-balls are quite intelligent. That's, uh, it means that it can uh, form different uh, shapes, like uh, uh, maybe a straight line or circle or some other shapes. So uh, I can see if one ball uh, have to be connected to another, and then uh, following this kind of rule, it can form a straight line. So I'm, I'm curious. So, uh, how what what kind of information they share with each other? Because when I spot should be should assign the uh, angle. Uh, I mean, they have to move in correct angle, in correct direction, uh, to form a correct uh, morphology. Otherwise, it be become a mess. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the as as I said before, we we have <coughs> built a, a library of different set of rules that the robots should use to form the different shapes. Okay, So when uh, one self-assembly starts, and let's say that you want uh, uh, to create an arrow. Okay. So the, the seed robot, so the first robot, starts the program Harrow. Yes. <coughs> and this program Harrow tells to that robot, I first light up my, uh, my lights in blue and yellow, for example, so another robot arrives and grasp me here. Yes, so here there is another point that you have to grasp, you, you have to grasp at the correct point, because yes. there is a circle, so there is a 360 degree, so which point shall I grasp? Okay, so you see here that this point this robot, where the, the other robot is attaching, half of the robot is uh, yellow and the half is blue. 
I see. So, so it's a border of different colors. border of different colors. I see. So that is the way it indicates where to attach. I see. Okay, thank you. So uh, I, have a, I have another question. So uh, in the part of go searching, uh, a lot of uh, S balls are, are just uh, forming uh, a path. I mean, uh, no, they are forming a chain yeah. to reach that goal. So uh, uh, how do they determine the direction, the correct direction to the goal? They don't. They don't? Okay. So they, as you see in the video, yes, they start building chains in all the directions and uh, it's a random process. So there might be a very long chain in a wrong direction and at yes. some point it destroys, but only yeah. when uh, the direction is the correct one, yeah. the chain will connect to the red object. Yeah. And when it is connected to the red object, it cannot be destroyed anymore. So it stays there and the other robots can use it to find the red object. I see. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. So are there questions uh, from this area? Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Thanks, sir. And uh, I'm just some confused about the pace form formation. From what and, and what, the, from what day? The pace formation. Just uh, you yeah. just use the robot to find the yeah. final yeah. direct oh, okay. chime. <clears throat> and the, uh, I, I did some research about the end optimal uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as you know that uh, the ants will use a phenomenon to uh, record the, the pace, if the pace is good or bad. But, uh, but in the pace formulation, in that side, in that slide, uh, I actually, I, I think there is no records about the uh, direction that uh, have been formed in the, in the yeah. past time. So uh, if, if, you, if the goal is far away from the object, uh, so there will be a maybe unlimited direction. One of them or some of them are, are <coughs> correct. So, uh, so I think uh, will will the robots uh, just form a direction that have been have been uh, breaked in the past time because it's very good. Yeah, and in fact, you're right. The if let's say that the farther away the object is from the goal location, the more difficult the problem becomes. Yeah. Yeah, because obviously the search space is much bigger. So. And you're right, there is no mechanism to record what has been done in the past. But this is not an optimization problem, so you should not compare it to ant colony optimization, it's completely different. And uh, the well, one thing is, obviously, the problem is more difficult, so it takes much longer uh, if the, the things are far away. But then you can introduce some mechanism to, make, to reduce this problem. So I have already said, one mechanism could be to let the chain be formed from one side and, and from the other side at the same time. Okay, so the, that they start not only from the blue, but also from the red. Then you can also have a chain that has warped the environment, so that while they, well, first they align, instead of being like this, they get straight, so they are longer. They can swap the environment, turn around the object, and then if the object uh, in the collocation is very far, yeah, then it's very difficult. Yeah, um, but uh, if you don't use any uh, mechanism to record the uh, history of the direction, so how can you ensure that uh, the robots will find a direct or some good direction to the to go in, a, in some maybe limited time. You know? Okay, so it's not a question of ensuring because uh, since the algorithm is stochastic, it will find it. Huh? It's rather a problem of uh, efficiency. Yeah, it, yes, maybe it will find in uh, minutes, right? Maybe it, uh, it will find in days. Yeah. So how can you uh, make sure that the time will not be too long? We, we don't make sure, yeah. Okay. 
So, the, but again, there's, the point of the experiment was not to make something very efficient to solve the problem, but it was rather to show that it is possible to get uh, specializations of teams of different behavior in a self-organized way. So the, um, it's, it's not like someone gave me the problem, find the most efficient way to connect this point to that point. Uh, the, the application, the experiment is, let's say, an excuse to be able to show that by self-organization you can get Swarm robots where all the robots are exactly identical, specialized in different roles. Okay, so this was the goal. Okay, so other questions from uh, other people? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the last. Um, professor, I have a question that uh, the rules that uh, the, uh, the green one, uh, uh, the one, uh, the gray one meet a green one, and it can turn to be a blue one. Yes. So the, the rules can be learned by this robot. If you, if I, uh, yeah, the, these rules can be learned by the robot itself. Maybe I. Maybe you can find a, a more simple uh, rule to uh, realize this. Okay, so the, the answer is in, in principle, yes. Uh, in practice, what we did was to, to use our brain instead of learning. Yes. Uh, so. so, for example, if uh, one robot uh, it, uh, touch the green <coughs> one, and he can, it can change randomly, it's called randomly, and uh, many times later, in, it, and it will find the, uh, the rules that a blue one uh, cage. Yeah, I think it, it would be an interesting experiment, but for sure you need three colors because uh, we wanted um, at least three colors because we wanted the, the chain to have a direction so that the robots can understand whether they should go in this direction or in that direction. And you cannot do this with two colors. So we already knew that we needed three, and uh, so it was already the minimum because. With two, we cannot do it. With three, it's fine. So, but it could be interesting to see whether you can learn it. But again, it's a, it's a different problem. But yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I may have uh, several questions. I will put it short. Uh, at uh, the pulling the child case, how do they uh, complete <coughs> the task allocation? They communicate or they use the. No, they don't. Yeah, okay. The, um, the first three videos that I've shown, they are more, uh, they are there to show people what could be done, okay? So they, they were not real, let's say, they were not scientific experiments. Okay. They were experiments anyway, but not. So what, in that case, the robots were programmed to form four, four okay. robots of four or five, yeah. So in the evolutionary evidence uh, case, is it individual learning or collective group learning? So each one will adapt back himself, or he will learn from others? Uh, no, it's in the evolutionary algorithm, the controller, so the weights of the neural network of each individual represent one small body. So basically, the network controls each of the S bots that form the swarm bot in the same way. So the swarm bot compete with each other in the genetic algorithm. Right. So I don't know. Was this question the question? Yeah. I yeah. Okay. okay. And for the uh, search uh, of the, the, the three uh, robots, three parts, hand, foot, eye, do they use infrared and vision? All together, or which do you want to use which, which one? The hand bot, yeah. foot bot, do they use only vision or vision plus infrared? Okay, so the robot on the ground use vision and use that sensor that I told you about, the range and bearing. So it's infrared. Yeah, right. Uh, the flying robots, they use vision and the end bot use vision. Yeah. 
Okay. So for, for the for the push the ball, do they learn that they cannot use a line and they form this uh, shape, or you just ask them to form a shape? We ask them to try different shapes uh, until they find one that is okay. Yeah. So yeah. do That's you? Right. It's not really learning. <laughs> do you design and manufacture all these uh, robots by yourself, or do you design and outsourcing the manufacturing? So the robots uh, <coughs> were built within uh, one of these European you know, projects, right? So the the design was done together between the different partners. Then some parts of the robots were built by some of the partners, and some parts were built outsourced. I think some parts were even built here in China. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, so let's thank uh, Professor Marco Dorigo again. It's an amazing talk. Thank you, thank you very much.